Hello chess fans, this is Rick from Chess to Impress. As I'm recording this video on Friday the 16th of April, it is only three days since the resumption of the Candidates Tournament, which is fantastic news. The 2020 FIDE Candidates Tournament, the second most important event in chess after the World Championship match itself, started in Yekaterinburg in Russia on March 17th, 2020, almost 13 months ago. It was stopped by FIDE, the World Chess Federation, just before round 8 was set to start on March 26th of that year, a day before all flights out of Russia were grounded. The pandemic thwarted all attempts to resume the 8-player tournament until now. And on Chess to Impress we continue our build-up towards the resumption of the candidates tournament. It is the 29th event in the history of the official and undisputed World Championship. And on Chess to Impress, we're looking at the first 28 candidate cycles in the history of our game. This is episode number 26. And before we take a dive into history, let's refresh our memory. These are the current standings and also the results of the last round of the current event. We have two leaders, Vashila Graf and Pomnishi, on plus two. And as you can see in the last round, round seven, Vashila Graf beat Nepomnishi to take the joint lead. Four players a full point behind Grishuk, Giri, Karana and Wang Hao and Alexienko and Ding have a lot of ground to make up. Round 8 will be played on Monday the 19th of April and we'll see Karana Vashela Graf, Wang Hao, Ding Liren, Nepomnishi Giri and Alexienko against Grishuk. I will be here after the round to tell you what happened. So let's now look at the history of the candidates tournaments and matches. It all started a long time ago in London 1883 where Zuckertort and Steinitz finished in the first two places in that event and that led to the first official World Championship match in 1886. Wilhelm Steinitz, the first World Champion, gained the right for a rematch against World Champion Emmanuel Lasker in St. Petersburg 1895-1896. And the next event was a long time after that. Paul Keres won the tournament in the Netherlands in 1938 and by doing so, he gained the right to challenge world champion Alexander Aljechin for the world title. Unfortunately, that title match never happened because of World War II. David Bronstein won the candidate cycle held in Budapest and Moscow in 1950 to challenge world champion Bot Winnick. Vasily Smyslov won two candidate cycles in Zurich 1953 and Amsterdam 1956. And by winning Yugoslavia 1959, Misha Tal gained the right to challenge Botvinnik for the world title. In 1962 it was Petrosian's turn to challenge Botvinnik and he became world champion one year later. Boris Pasky also won two cycles in 1965 and 1968 and Bobby Fischer qualified in 1971 for the match of the century the year after against world champion Spassky. Anatoly Karpov beat Viktor Korchnoi in Moscow in 1974 and by doing that he gained the right to challenge world champion Bobby Fischer. Fischer didn't play and Karpov became the 12th world champion by default. Viktor Korsnoy won two more cycles, both times lost to Karpov in a world championship match and the Kasparov era started in 1984. He became world champion one year later. Karpov came back, won the next two cycles. In total Karpov and Kasparov played five world championship matches against each other and Nigel Short broke that era by becoming the challenger in 1993. In 1995, Anand gained the right to challenge Kasparov, and it should have been Alexei Shirov who was Kasparov's next challenger. By beating Vladimir Kramnik in Katsorla in 1998, but Shirov never got a match. Kramnik did and became the 14th world champion in the year 2000. Leko was Kramnik's first challenger and four players qualified for the World Championship Tournament in 2007. Aranyan, Gelfand, Grishuk and Leko. That World Championship Tournament was won by Anand and Topalov, Gelfand and Carlsen were Anand's challengers. Carlsen beat Anand, but Anand came back by winning Gantiman 6 2014. It is in red there because we're going to look at that cycle in this video. Carlsen won again and defended his title successfully against Karyakin and Karana in the next two cycles. So who will it be? Yekaterinburg 2020-2021. We will find out very soon who will be the next challenger of world champion Magnus Carlsen. As said, we're going to look at the 2014 cycle. 
The challenger was determined in the 2014 Candidates Tournament, an eight-player double round-robin tournament that took place in Khantibansysk in Russia from March 13th to March 31st of that year. The tournament had a prize fund of 420,000 euros. Prize money was shared between players tied on points. Tie breaks were not used to allocate the prize money. These were the eight participants, the loser of the last World Championship match, which was Vishwanathan Anand, the top two finishers of the most recent Chess World Cup, Kramnik and Andrejkin, and two players from the FIDE Grand Prix cycle, Topalov and Mamedyarov. Two players qualified on rating, Aranyan and Karyakin, and the organizing committee's wildcard went to Peter Svitler. And this is the bracket from the tournament. Anand won, and that was a big surprise. The oldest player in the tournament showed that he was still a very strong force to be reckoned with. Karyakin a full point behind, Kramnik, Mamedyarov and Andrejkin on 50%. Aronyan and Svitler on minus one and Topalov at the bottom of the table on minus two. In this video we're going to look at the first round when Vishwanathan Anand had the white pieces against tournament favorite Levon Aronyan. Here we see both players at the opening phase of that game. Let's have a look at what happens. It is the 13th of March 2014. White Anand, Black Aronyan. The first round of the 2014 candidates tournament. For this video I'm using analysis from Anish Giri, who's playing in the 2020-21 event from the magazine New in Chess and from Grandmaster Milos from the Chess-based website. Giri writes, every triumph starts with the beginning and in a chess tournament it is often the, that key game that determines the final outcome. In Hantiman sees this time that key game was played right in the first round. Let's have a look at what happened. We have a Spanish opening on the board, as you can see, with bishop b5. I'm going to put the opening moves on the board. There's not much to comment there, because both players were playing a theoretical line. The bishop dropped back, castling d3, and then d5, the famous martial gambit, one of Aronian's favorites. So Anand could have expected Aronian to go for this. Black is going to sacrifice a pawn. e takes d5 from Anand, and Knight takes d5, and here you can take on e5 straight away, winning that pawn. But in the game, knight bd2 was Anand's choice. Giri writes, this is Anand's idea. He had played it before against Karana, a game he lost. So he must have found an improvement on that game. In that Anand-Karana game, Karana played f6 here, c3 and king h8. And black went on to win in the end. But Aronyan did not play f6, he played queen d7, which Giri calls an interesting novelty in the spirit of the opening. He's not hanging on to that e5 pawn. Now Anand went for it, knight takes e5, knight takes d5, and rook takes e5. White has won a pawn, and now knight f6. This move was played after 8 seconds, quite dramatic to play a novelty, and then miss a spectacular knight sacrifice two moves later, writes Giri. And what he meant was that instead of knight f6, knight f4 could have been played. Knight f3, and there is that knight sacrifice, knight takes g2. The king takes, and then a5 with threats of a4, winning the bishop, and also rook a6, swinging a rook over to the king's side with an attack on white's king. But knight f6 was Aronian's choice. Rook e1 with an exclamation mark, which is not so much for the move as it is for the entire plan used by Anand to try to refute Black's idea, writes Giri. Rook a2 e8, knight f3, bishop d6, bishop e3 and rook e7. Giri writes that Aronian took his time here, but in fact this is a little too slow. In general, Levon is comfortable playing a pawn down, so he probably did not need to hurry. But Giri says knight d5 would have been a better move, more powerful with the idea of taking on e3 at the appropriate moment. But as said, rook e7 was Aronian's choice. d4, rook fe8, c3 and h6. Again, blank. black has the option of knight d5, says Giri. But Aronian does not see the threat, because after h6 the move from the game Anand played knight e5, and Giri says this is the key to white's strategy. Give the pawn back to simplify into an endgame with the two bishops. A slight risk-free advantage for white. 
Let's see how they developed. We see a lot of capturing moves now. Let's go through them. Queen takes d7, the queens come off the board, and now rook ed1 and knight f6. After this move, black is in big trouble, says Geary. It was played instantly, and Geary believes this was a moment for a 40-minute think instead. And then maybe knight c5 would have been the move that Aranyan would have come up with. Geary gives this variation. Bishop takes, rook takes, rook d7 and rook e2 with counterplay and good chances of holding, even though the pawn on f7 will fall. Another option after rook ed1 instead of knight f6, the move from the game is bishop c6. That's also better than the move played knight f6 by Aronian. c4, that move also gets an exclamation mark from Geary. c6, and that was played after a 40 minute think, which Geary says Aronian left too late, but black is already in big trouble. Rook ac1, rook 5 to e7, and a4 putting extra pressure on the queenside pawns. As Giri mentioned, white is a very nice position. Great play from Anand, giving back his extra pawn to get a slightly better position with the two bishops. Game goes on, b takes c4, Anand recaptured, knight d5, and such passive ugly positions are rarely tenable, says Giri. Bishop c5 attacking the rook, rook e4, and f3. Attacking a rook again. Anand's play is very natural and instructive. He pulls his bishops back and activates his rooks. That's what we'll see in the next few moves. Let's see how Anand plays this. Indeed, pulling back his, the bishops. Rook 4 to e5 was Aronian's move. King f2. The bishops control the entire board. Bishop back to c8. And there comes the first move back with the bishop to give room to the rooks. In the style of Anatoly Karpov, writes Giri, and he calls this sweet. Rook 5 to e6, rook d3, knight f4, and rook b3. The weaknesses on the queen side are decisive. Black is just lost. Rook d8, and there goes that second bishop back. Knight d5, and bishop d2. Now nothing can stop the invasion with either rook b8, or as we'll see in the game, rook b6. Knight f6 from Aranyan, bishop a5, and here you can play rook d4. It will not help black attacking the pawn on a4, but then there is rook b8 attacking the bishop, and after rook e8 there is rook takes c6, and white is winning. In the game, Aranyan did not go for rook d4 in this position. He played rook d to e8, and then rook b6 wins a pawn for white. Rook e5, bishop c3, knight d5, and you can take on c6. That is a technically winning endgame, as well as Anand mentioned after the game. But Anand decides to go for the idea of trapping the knight, which is also very nice. So instead of taking on c6, he took on e5. Knight takes b6, a rook is traded that way. Bishop d4, attacking the knight. Knight takes a4. If you go to d5 instead, then rook takes c6 is the move. But by taking on a4, that knight will now get trapped. Rook takes c6, rook d8. Aranyan made the time control. This is move 40 and is coming up with some tricks. But Anand calculates everything perfectly. Rook c4, and now that knight is well and truly trapped. It doesn't have any squares. Aronian is a tricky character. Bishop d7, b3 attacking the knight, bishop b5 counterattacking the rook. Rook saves itself, knight b2, and can you not just take that knight? Yes, you can, but then there is rook d2 check, winning the piece back, king e3, rook takes, bishop takes b5, a takes b5, and black will very likely be able to hold this rook and game to a draw. So that's not the way to play. After knight b2, you should not take that knight. Anand, of course, saw that. He took the bishop. A takes b5 and king e3. King e2 instead would have been a mistake due to knight c4, exclamation mark. B takes c4 and then the bishop is hanging. So Anand had to be careful and play accurately. And he did. He played king e3, protecting the bishop. 
If you now play knight d1 check, then there is king e2 and that knight is now lost. In the game, rook e8 check was played by Aronyan, king d2, rook d8, king c3, and here Aronyan resigned on move 47. If you play knight d1 check, then there is king c2, and it's a very nice mirroring line of the knight d1 and king e2 variation we just saw. Which is quite pretty according to Giri, and I'm sure we all agree. Wonderful start for Anand beating Aranyan, the pre-tournament favorite, in the first round. And as said, he went on to win the tournament for a rematch against world champion Magnus Carlsen. I covered that match in my series on the world championship matches. The link to the second Carlsen Anand match is up here. I hope you like this video and that you'll keep counting down towards the resumption of the candidates tournament with me. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, please subscribe to the Chess to Impress channel and please leave a comment. I will read them all and I will reply to them all. If you liked the video, it would be great if you could share it on social media by clicking the share button on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram, on Twitter and on Facebook. This is Rick for Chess to Impress. Thank you for watching.